Hello, LifePoint Church. Welcome back to day two on our lesson for this week on unwavering faith. We left off yesterday talking a little bit about Elijah and John the Baptist and how they shared similar experiences in the sense that they were called by God to give a message that was contrary to what was going on around them. They were given a message by God to essentially call out the wickedness and the evil that was going on in the day. Both John and Elijah stood for righteousness despite political pressure to compromise. The, the pressure at the time was to, to compromise, to find the kind of the middle ground. And the pressure upon, of our secular society against you know, um, righteousness and anything that represents righteousness is not something new. You know, we feel like it's more than ever, and it may be, but it's always been there. A wicked queen or a wicked king is not just a recent phenomenon. History is littered with potentates putting pressure on the people of God. We may, express it, we may experience pressure from civil leaders, employers, or even family members to compromise our faith, but God will come to our rescue if we take a stand. We contend for the faith when we refuse to give up or to give in. You know, I think it's important that in this time and where we are right now with COVID-19 and everything going on, to understand that while we are not able to gather together, while we are respecting that, um, that mandate from the government to not gather together at this particular time, our message has not changed. And our message will not change because it is the message of truth. It is the message of God. You know, it's one thing for the government to say, hey, you know, we need to take a break from meeting together. But the government is not telling us you need to change the truth. We're not compromising to change the truth. And I think it's important for us all to remember that and to be stronger than ever in the truth and the revelation that God has given us and to stand firm in what he has for us. The church in Ephesus hated the same thing that the Lord hated, the doctrine and the deeds of the Nicolaitans. In Revelations 2-3, to the Lord spoke to the seven churches in Asia Minor, and these churches had been started after the outpouring of the Holy Ghost in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and the establishment of the Jerusalem church. Now the church in Pergamos was directly targeted for subscribing to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which the Lord said that he hated. Some say the Nicolaitans, Nicolaitans were the spiritual descendants of Nicholas and of Antioch. He had been ordained as a deacon in Acts 6 and 5. The fact that Nicholas was a proselyte tells us he was not born a Jew, but had converted from paganism to Judaism. Then Nicholas experienced a second conversion, this time from Judaism to Christianity. From this information, we know a few facts. One, Nicholas came from paganism and probably had deep pagan roots, unlike the other six deacons who came from pure Hebrew lineage. His pagan background probably exposed him to activities of the cult in that day and time. And the doctrine of the Nicolaitans was the doctrine of compromise. Ephesus and Pergamos were cities given over to the, un to the occult and the unbridled pagan worship. In fact, Pergamos was where the altar of Zeus itself was located. Irenaeus, who is a post-apostolic father and student of Polycarp, wrote extensively about the Nicolaitan doctrine. He connected it to Nicholas of Antioch, but more importantly, he described it as a doctrine as overindulgence of the flesh. If it, in other words, if it feels good, do it. That was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Another post-apostolic leader in the early church wrote that this doctrine was a doctrine of compromise, implying some saw, that some saw total separation between Christianity and the practice of paganism was not really essential, and that was what was seen by this doctrine. From early church records, it seems apparent that Nicholas was so immersed in occultism, Judaism, and Christianity he could stomach all of it, so he just meshed it all together. He had no problem intermingling these belief systems and saw no reason why believers could not continue to fellowship with those still immersed in the black magic of the Roman Empire and its countless mystery cults. Occultism was a major force that warred against the early church. In Ephesus, the primary pagan religion at that time was the worship of Diana or Artemis. There were many other forms of idolatry in Ephesus, but this was the primary object of occult worship in that city. 
In the city of Pergamos, there were numerous dark and sinister forms of occultism. In both of these cities, believers were lambasted and persecuted fiercely by people that followed the pagan religions. And they were forced to contend with paganism on a level far beyond all of the other cities in that area. It was difficult for believers to live separated from all the activities of paganism because paganism and its religions were the center focus of the city in that place. A converted Gentile would have found it more difficult to stay away from all pagan influence. It's significant that the deeds and the doctrines of the Nicolaitans were, are only mentioned in connection with the churches in these two particular cities. It seems that the doctrine of the Nicolaitans was it was all right to have one foot in each world and a person need not be strict about separation from the world in order to be a Christian. This, in fact, was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans that Jesus hated so much. It led to a weak version of Christianity that was that without power and without conviction. It was a defeated, worldly type of Christianity. The doctrine of compromise can be defeated with unwavering faith in the Word of God. The church of Ephesus was not perfect, but God commended them for hating the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. He commended them for hating the doctrine of compromise. We live in a day and age when we think it's not spiritual to hate. When we really love God and the Word of God, we will hate the things that are against God and His Word. No, we will not hate people, but we will hate the things that are against God's Word. The Word of God will convict us and force us to live a life that is uncompromising. It will move us out of the middle and force us to break off ungodly alliances. It's important, more important probably than ever before that we do not succumb to the doctrine of compromise. That we are not happy with having one foot in the world doing whatever we want and one foot in Christianity to kind of bail us out when it's necessary in our minds. We need to be steadfast, unwavering in faith, completely dedicated to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the doctrine that, is, that he preached, the doctrine, that was the doctrine of truth. I hope that you all have enjoyed this lesson, and I'll see you again tomorrow for day three.